I will try to give you an overview of the current state of structural bioinformatics uh, and specifically in what we are doing right now in my team. As uh, most of you may know, we just had a revolution in structural bioinformatics. It all started around CASP. 13 with a few models, including alpha fold one and around CASP 14, it became uh, very clear that the problem of protein structure prediction is essentially solved. So what you see on this slide is uh, the accuracy of structure prediction with respect to the difficulty of particular targets. Difficulty means uh, if we have structural templates in the protein data bank or not. So you may see even that even without the templates, the accuracy of protein structure prediction became nearly experimental. This is measured in very strange units, which are global distance test, but uh, the accuracy of 90 corresponds to about 1.5 1 angstroms of RMSD from the crystallographic structure. So these are very known, very well-known examples from DeepMind, two targets with near experimental accuracy. And uh, why did it happen? Because of multiple developments, mostly in data science area. And if you'd like, to learn more about uh, the progress which led to these discoveries. We co-authored uh, a review for the special CASP-14 issue in the Proteins Journal. So this was during CASP-14, which was already two years ago, and we just had the conference for the CASP-15. What were the differences? You may see the slide from Dan Rigden, he was, uh, who was the evaluator of the protein structure prediction during CASP-15. And you may see here that the most of the top performing methods were using in one or another way alpha fold 2. So it's still alpha fold 2, which dominates protein structure prediction. The best, the top rank non alpha fold 2 method was uh, the one from David Baker's team here, somewhere in the middle. And very interestingly, we had multiple models that didn't use multiple sequence alignment at all. They were based on protein language models based on a single sequence. But unfortunately, this method, so they are marked in violet, these methods are not yet performing so well. Okay, a bit of history. Why do we need, why do we care about protein structure prediction? The answer is uh, rather simple because most practically structural databases contain only about 0.1% of proteins discovered across life forms. The protein structure prediction problem became known and popular quite a while ago, and the first attempts to predict protein structure started back in the early 70s. With uh, multiple attempts using molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations, but we had to wait until 1998 to see the first truly nearly one microsecond long molecular dynamic simulations of a short peptide. The study was conducted by Peter Coleman and it took them two months with fully occupied two Cray supercomputers. And it was not a true protein, it was a 36 residue short peptide. And shortly after, many more folding molecular dynamic simulations followed, including all different types. So for example, uh, GPU accelerated simulations and also uh, simulations using very specialized hardwares. But very interestingly, the success in protein structure prediction didn't come from molecular dynamics. Uh, let's look at the problem of protein structure prediction from a different uh, 
angle, from a slightly different angle, we may notice that the shape of a protein is preserved much more than the sequence. For example, in this slide, you may see that all different but homologous sequences would result in nearly the same three-dimensional structure. This motivated the researchers, the researchers to use so-called so -called, uh, homology modeling. So we may model new proteins by comparing individual sequences. We may model proteins comparing the multiple sequence alignments, also called profiles, or we can also substitute three-dimensional fragments for homologous sequences. Now, if we look at the sequence profile a bit closer, we may notice some conserved regions. So they're marked here and also regions that would co-evolve together. It turned out that couplings between these co-evolved positions may serve as a very good estimate of 3D protein contacts. The first attempts to estimate these couplings were made in the early 90s, followed by routine estimation of protein contacts with the developments of so-called POTS or direct coupling analysis models. In these models, the probability to observe a certain sequence depends on the conservation coefficients and the coupling coefficients. And these coefficients can be estimated from the sequence profiles. Later on, around CASP 13, these models were additionally supervised using deep learning by the observed uh, protein contacts. And in the last generation of structure prediction models, there is no any statistical model at all. These models would use the multiple sigmas alignment directly and would estimate protein contacts without any statistical models, just using deep learning. So, we believe that the classical protein structure prediction problem is essentially solved, but there are still many developments uh, around protein representations, and there are many more exciting developments in using protein language models and also applying uh, protein language models and coevolution models to other types of molecules, for example, to RNAs and DNAs. We also believe that molecular dynamics will be used in some areas less specifically for protein structure prediction, but uh, the so-called uh, protein coding problem it also involves protein kinetics. And the structure prediction problem is not the coding problem, so coding kinetics yet has to be predicted. Uh, there have been some progress specifically around CASP15 around protein docking, so there have been uh, many attempts to predict it at a much higher accuracy. And we still need to predict protein multiple states and protein flexibility. Uh, then we need to predict or simulate protein behavior at physio physiological conditions. And finally, there are many exciting developments around the inverse problem, the protein design. So if we know a certain shape, which serve a certain protein function, then we can design a specific sequence that would fold into this three-dimensional shape. And uh, these are uh, the current exciting developments in this field. So I will start by introducing the algorithms developed in our team around protein interactions in solution. Uh, we've been interested in protein, protein, protein ligand interactions for quite some years. And we've been specifically interested in symmetrical assemblies. Why do we care about protein symmetries? Because uh, most of the high order assemblies are symmetrical. And if we look into the protein data bank, we will see that about third of the assemblies uh, would, satisfy, would satisfy 
some, some type of a point group symmetry. So we introduced a specific formalism based on rigid body operators that would include rotation, translation, and symmetry operator. And we designed an exhaustive search algorithm based on these operators. We would project all of these operators into the Fourier space, and we demonstrated that the shape complementarity or the docking score can be formulated in the Fourier space using all the symmetry constraints, constraints implicitly. And this allowed us uh, to exhaustively sample all possible symmetries in just a few seconds on a personal laptop. We can formulate the dual problem. If the protein assembly is known, for example, if it's solved by X-ray crystallography or cryo microscopy, we can basically look at the same problem and the estimation of correspondence of one unit with respect to another unit. Here, however, we would know in advance the rotation and translation operators, and we can estimate the symmetry operator. So this problem can be solved analytically with respect to the best matching, meaning that we would estimate the best rotation and the best translation for each of the symmetry axes. And the estimation would give us a list of all possible symmetry axes with uh, their accuracy. We have also developed, I believe, the fastest calculator of uh, small angle scattering profiles, both for X-rays and for neutrons, which is based on the fast multiple expansion, which scales nearly linearly with the size of the system. So in this example, I simulated the scattering profile of the largest particle I could find, which consists of 160,000 of scattering centers. And uh, the whole simulation of the scattering profile takes only about three seconds on a personal laptop. So the speed and also the accuracy of the model allows to interactively refine the molecular shapes. And here you can see a couple of examples of the shape optimization, which was also a part of the CASP 13 exercise where our model performed the best. Finally, the same rigid body formalism can be combined with the uh, small angle scattering calculator. So we can analytically apply rotation and translation, rigid body rotation and translation operators to one of the partners, for example, to simulate a protein, uh, so, sorry, a scattering profile from an assembly. So we can apply the rotation and translation operators to one of the partners, so we can project it into the Fourier space and we can apply some additional averaging to obtain the scattering intensities. This, for example, allows to scan many thousands of docking solutions uh, very rapidly. So it takes about one minute to scan 100,000 of docking solutions. And if we look at the performance on a standard docking benchmark, we see that docking with respect to the scattering profile provides a much more success rate compared to only the energy-based docking. So this is one of the particular examples where the energy-based docking does not really find the right solution. So if we look at the RMSD to the solution with respect to the classical ZDOC energy, there is no funnel. So if we zoom in, we see that uh, there is no correlation between the predicted docking energies and the distance to the uh, crystallographic solution. But if we do the same experiment and measure uh, the accuracy of the scattering profile, so the chi-square to the experimentally measured profile, then we may see that 
the correlation of chi square with respect to the distance to the crystallographic solution is much, much, much better. So in this case, specifically for some elongated shapes, SACS or SANS profile can be very good proxies of the right docking positions. And exactly the same formalism applying rigid body transformation to the scattering particles can be used to analytically compute protein crowding or aggregation effects. So the formalism is absolutely the same, but then we apply some additional averaging in the angular space, which allows to analytically treat uh, structure factors for complex particles, and uh, this allows to analytically compute crowding effects. So here you may see uh, the scattering profile for a single particle in black and for a particle uh, with crowders in purple. And finally, recently, very recently, we have extended the same formalism to simulate crowded, crowding, crowded particles altogether. So this was our first attempt towards self-simulation. What did we do? We have pre-computed individual interactions of crowders with respect to each other using the fast Fourier transform. And we used this pre-computed energy in a Monte Carlo simulation. This allowed us to perform very fast simulations on a personal computer, which scales from milliseconds to seconds. And uh, there are many more extensions of these simulations. For example, we're planning to also run Brownian dynamic simulations, and so we can also do sequential or replicate exchange simulations. So in the proof of concept, of concept experiment, we simulated several systems. The largest would be composed of five different proteins, and this was our simulation box watch the simulations allowed us to measure. So they allow us to measure, for example, the diffusion constant of one particle with respect to the concentration of the particles. And uh, the simulated values fit very well the analytical predictions. Or we can also measure the diffusion constants with respect uh, to the volume of the particles. So these simulations didn't follow the analytics that well. And we're currently trying to extend the model with more physics. Our method also allows to run many more simulations at different temperatures and different concentrations. So here you may see the evolution of the energy of the system with respect to the uh, temperature at different concentrations. And you may clearly see the melting temperature, or we can measure the same way the diffusion constant with respect to the temperature and again here you may see the melting regime so this was the proof of concept study and currently we're extended extending it by adding hydrodynamic interactions and also flexibility because so far all our particles were rigid so let me switch into protein flexibility. Why? Why flexibility? Because proteins are flexible and many of them perform their function by interacting with other partners. The flexibility can be very efficiently simulated by adding just a few additional collective coordinates or degrees of freedom, which can be computed using molecular dynamics or the so-called normal mode analysis. So why is it interesting? Because we can explain uh, experimental observations. For example, my colleagues have measured by X-ray two structures of a membrane complex, one in the active and the other in the non-active forms. And the normal mode analysis allowed us to simulate the transition from the non-active to the active state using just a few collective coordinates. So here you can see that these collective motions involve a rotation in the membrane part and the scissor-like motion in the extracellular part. 
So what is the normal mode analysis and how is it linked to molecular dynamics? Both technique aims to solve the Newton's equations of motions. And what normal mode analysis is doing, it assumes that our system is not very far from the equilibrium position and the potential energy in such an approximation can be expanded into the Taylor series. The first derivative vanishes and we can very efficiently represent the potential energy using just the second order term, which is also known as the Hessian matrix. Now, if we plug this back, it turns out that we can solve the Newton's equations of motions analytically and we get uh, the transition from the so-called normal space into the Cartesian space using a linear transformation, which is the diagonalization of the Hessian matrix, which has links to the very popular technique currently in cryo electron microscopy, which estimates the latent variables for reconstructing the structural heterogeneity. So if we look into CrySpark or CryDragon, they both currently estimate the encoder part and the latent variable. So the latent variable would correspond to the normal space and the encoder would correspond to the linear transformation from the Cartesian to the normal variables. Also, very frequently, the normal mode analysis is not performed on a very sophisticated force field, but in many practical applications, we can use a much more simpler model, which very often is the elastic network model. The idea is that we can link all our atoms or residues or bits or particles by harmonic springs. And in such a model, we will have only a single adjustable parameter that will be the cutoff distance at which the particles or the atoms are linked together. Historically, there was a bottleneck how to diagonalize large matrices, how to arrive to the linear transformation from the initial space to the normal space. There have been many different approaches proposed, and one of the more successful was the coarse graining technique where we would split the initial system into a set of rigid blocks such that each rigid block would contain only six independent variables. Three would correspond to rotations and another three would correspond to translations. And effectively the diagonalization problem will be simplified because we will multiply it by the transformation from the initial space into the rigid block space that would produce uh, a much smaller rigid block Hessian, which is much faster to diagonalize, to diagonalize. Our contribution to this field was to notice that diagonalization in this space also leads to the estimation of angular and linear velocities applied to each of the rigid blocks which allows us to effectively extend and extrapolate the motions to very large amplitudes. So here on top, you may see the classical normal mode analysis, where at large amplitudes, the initial protein structure, well, actually it's a complex here, is very much distorted. And if we apply the nonlinear approach, as we do, then it can be extrapolated at very large amplitudes without the distortion. Also, our method is very uh, CPU and memory efficient. We can simulate very large structures at nearly interactive rates. So we could simulate the largest uh, ribosome, ribosome complex that I could find in the protein data bank. And this simulation took me about 10 minutes on a personal laptop. So how can we use this technique? Uh, there are many possible applications. For example, uh, we can interactively flex the initial systems. We can open binding pockets. Uh, this is an interactive simulation that allows the user to open a pocket of a protein. So what do we do? We pre-compute uh, the normal modes, some of the lowest normal modes of the protein alone. Then we specify automatically or by the user a possible binding pocket. 
And after we project the pre-computed normal mode on the pocket, and the algorithm estimates the best combination of the normal modes so that would deform the pocket the most. Uh, we can also computationally simulate large transition, for, for example, from the unbound to the bound state. So uh, this is a classical protein-protein benchmark where the goal is to predict the bound state if we only have the knowledge of the unbound protein. So here we show the success with respect to the number of normal nodes involved. And we may see that if we use only 10 normal modes, then we can, simul we can simulate about 35% of the transitions. In some cases, just a single mode provides already a half of the, of the required transition. For example, this particular case shown on the next slide, here a single mode uh, can very ac accurately simulate the transition from the unbound red to the bound blue structure. On the right, you may see another example where again, just a few normal modes can predict the normal mode analysis is the estimation of the protein region domains. So what do we do? We compare the flexibility of different parts of the protein and then link uh, those parts that behave similarly together. This allows us to automatically identify rigid protein domains. And we can also compute normal modes in the rigid domain approximation. So here you can see the estimation of mode one, mode two, and mode three for a membrane protein uh, in the approximation of seven rigid domains. Uh, I must say that uh, by default, we're using the elastic network model, which has uh, specific limitations. For example, if the elastic network is too dense, we cannot easily simulate uh, large structural transitions. We are trying to find workarounds uh, about this problem. For example, what we have recently introduced was an automatic removal of some of the artificial links in the elastic network model. And so these links are detected from the contact map as those unconnected patches. And if we remove them, then the success to generate large motions is much higher compared to the original elastic network model. And finally, there is a very nice analytical connection between molecular dynamics and the normal mode analysis. This is known as the quasi-harmonic approximation. For example, if we know a molecular dynamics trajectory of a protein, so here it was a coil-coil system simulated with a very sophisticated force field uh, with explicit water for about one microsecond. And having the simulated trajectory, we can apply and top the principal component analysis. And what you see on the right is the principal component one and the principal component three estimated from the MD trajectory. The MD trajectory took us about 60,000 for hours. And here you may also see the normal mode analysis from a static structure using the elastic network model. Essentially, the motions are the same. So here you may see normal mode one and normal mode three. So the first mode is a bending motion. The third mode is a twist motion. But this estimation is much, much, much faster. So this estimation took me less than one second. And the speed up is uh, 10 to the power of nine times. So one of the take home messages is if you're only interested in near equilibrium dynamics, there is uh, no need to run expensive molecular dynamic simulations. The normal mode analysis can do it uh, much faster with the same accuracy. Another message is that there is a nice connection between 
molecular dynamics and the normal mode analysis. And if we know estimations of the poses, we can also compute the normal mode subspace. Which brings me to the last part of my talk and to the Elixir European project uh, with many European partners with the aim to chart and analyze the structural heterogeneity in the protein data bank. Our project consists of three different packages. So in the first package, the goal is to cluster similar structures by sequence and by structure. Then in the second package, we aim to characterize all types of flexibilities. And in the final package, we aim to provide biophysical and functional characterizations of the absorbed flexibilities. We have already compiled a master benchmark from what is absorbed in the protein data bank, starting from very simple cases where all the protein chains can be clustered to just two stable clusters such that the structural heterogeneity can be effectively described with a single motion. So one PCA or one normal mode is sufficient to cover 95% of the absorbed structural variants. Then we have more difficult examples where three modes are sufficient or even more sophisticated cases. For example, in case of Kirkpel modeling, we have about 500 different protein chains in the PDB and we need about 15 principal components and modes to explain 95% of the variance. And we may have even more difficult cases where many more components, many more modes are needed to describe the structure of heterogeneity. And finally, we are using this benchmark to learn the linear and nonlinear motions observed in the PDB. So our idea is that all the observed protein conformations can be mapped to linear or nonlinear but low dimensional manifolds. And having several states, we can compute some linear or nonlinear transitions from one state to the other state. This is a particular example of the ITPS cluster. If we compute linear transitions from start to the end, all the atoms, all the residues will be moving along straight lines. But if we try to estimate the nonlinear transitions, nonlinear manifolds, the atoms will be moving along the curves. Uh, why do we aim to, to estimate uh, nonlinear transitions? Because what our experiments demonstrate us the linear transitions are often not sufficient to interpolate or extrapolate the motions. For example, here the goal was to estimate the motion manifold by, uh, based on two unconnected clusters and then to predict a structure which lies somewhere in between. So if we use just the linear interpolation from one cluster to another cluster, then the linear PCA reconstruction would be situated rather far from the intermediate structure observed in the protein data bank. However, if we assume that the manifold is nonlinear and we would use only two distinct clusters for the estimation of this nonlinear manifold, then the estimation of the of the intermediate is much, much better. So this is still work in progress. And on the next stage, we will do the same experiments on the whole protein data bank. This is my time to draw the conclusions. So protein structure prediction problem, the classical protein structure prediction problem is essentially solved. But this is far from the end of the structure of bioinformatics. There are many new challenges 
which include prediction simulations of proteins in solutions, their interactions with other proteins, with DNAs, RNAs, and small molecules, and eventually simulations on the whole cell level. And from our experiments on the structural heterogeneity in the protein data bank, uh, we may conclude that learning motions from the experimental structures are definitely possible but tricky, where very often prone to overfitting. And on the next step, we are aiming to learn the motions on the whole PDB ones. So if you're interested in our software, we have many packages on our team's website and also our server that simulates uh, scattering profiles from X-ray uh, and from neutrons. And also it allows you to do flexible fitting of initial models into the scattering profile structures. And finally, I'd like to shamelessly advertise the upcoming workshop on interplay between AI and mathematical modeling in the post-structural genomics era. So we still have a few slots available. So if you're interested, please contact me. And I'd like to thank my collaborators, Elodie Lane, Pablo Chacon, Clement Olifnovich, and my students. And thank you very much for your attention.